Good morning, everyone, and welcome into ClayShareCon Day 4. I am Jessica Putnam Phillips, the founder of ClayShare, and today we have got a jam-packed day full of glazing and firing for you. And at the end, we have a special little treat. I'll be doing a hand-building demo with Garrity Tools. So we have got this morning um, getting a great start to glazing. The most important part is prepping your pottery before you glaze. So we are going to have a little quick tutorial on that in just a second. And then I'm going to do Melty Make, my favorite um, glaze tutorials to give because I love melty glazes and who doesn't. And then we're going to be glazing large pieces with Jeff from GR Pottery Forms. So he's going to join us. Then we're going to going to pop over. Actually, I think we're going to pop over to Drew first before glazing large pieces for what's the best kiln for you? Not just for your pottery needs, but for your budget needs because that's important as well. So we have that coming up. And then we're going to use some Georgie's Interactive Pigment. That's what I have here. So Georgie's Interactive Pigments for bringing out all your gorgeous texture. And the last glazing demo I'm doing today will be layering Amico glazes. So I've got where I got those guys. They're back here, these little bowls. So we got some fabulous combos with Amico. Um, and then we'll do the Garrity hand building. So it's a, it's a full day. And we do have a studio tour uh, that we're going to be popping in as well. Um, all the studio tours are attached to the end of my demos. After ClayShareCon is over, we will be pulling the studio tours out separately into their own little chunk. So those of you who have been asking, how do I find the studio tours? Well, you watch the demos to begin with. And then after ClayShareCon is over, we have to edit the entire video and that will take about an hour each video to pull that out. So we'll take care of that after. But right now they're just attached to the end. So I am really excited. Good morning, everybody. I see everybody's happy to be here. My mom is watching. Hello, mom. And all of our fabulous ClayShare family is here. And everybody's saying how much they love the Clayscape sponsored after party last night. We had a surprise Raku firing. So if you didn't join us for that, don't worry. You can go ahead and watch that as a replay on any of the ClayShare apps, ClayShare.com. Wherever you watch ClayShare, you can watch that. Actually, wherever you watch ClayShare, you can watch all of ClayShareCon. It will be up forever and ever and ever and ever. So let's get on in because this is a short one. Um, I believe this one is only um, a little 30 minute one because it's not, it's not huge, but it's really, really important. So when your pieces first come out of the bisque or whether they have been sitting on the shelf for a couple years, which they can, you can fire bisque pots that you've had for years sitting on your shelf. It doesn't matter how long they've been there. Um, you want to make sure they're ready for glazing. So you want to prepare the pieces. And so I always start by doing a little feel. We have to feel our pieces. We'll start with this cup. This is a cup I carved a few weeks ago uh, using a diamond core tools. Uh, do you remember that? That was the P, the T6. Was it the T6? I think the spade trimming tool. I can't remember, but it's a trimming tool, but I carved with it because you can. And it's got a few rough spots. So you feel your piece over. You don't want any sharp spots. You want to take care of that. So you're going to grab a sponge and clean water, clean sponge, clean water. And I just do a wet wipe. Some people will run their pottery underwater to clean. The problem with that is you then have to wait for everything to dry out for it to absorb the glaze. So I'm just getting all the dust off. And then you want to feel and you feel a rough spot, you want to sand that rough spot off now because it's only going to get worse. As you put glaze on it, it will become a really hard, sharp bit. And if it's on a place like the lip, someone's going to put this to their mouth and they could cut their lip on it or it just won't be pleasant. So you want to take care of that. And what I have and what I use in my studio are these little diamond core tools, sanding um, pads and sponges. So I've got a couple different ones here. And honestly, they, whatever one is more affordable is the one that I usually go with. So are we giving away some of these today? Is that what we're doing today for? Uh, we do have some of those. We're, got some, we're giving away some of these today. So somebody's gonna win a whole bunch of sanding pads, which is really exciting. So these one right, these ones here that I have come in all kinds of grits. And if you watched my video yesterday where we were getting the smooth bottoms using the grinding disc, you could use these as well. You could use these as well. 
and just rub your bottoms with one of these after it comes out of the kiln, the glaze fire, if, if you want to, you know, it's all up to you. So Kathleen says she runs it underwater, it takes seconds to dry. So, so that's how she does it. I guess it depends. I don't have running water in my studio. <laughs> so my only option is a bucket of water. So if you have a faucet in your studio, you are very lucky and you could just run it under that then. But I have adapted because I don't have water. So these come in 60, we'll go through them all, 60 grit. That's the um, biggest grit. And then they move down to finer grits, 120, 200, 400, 800, all the way down to a 1500. Now the 1500 is really fine. I hardly ever use it, but it, it, it would be good for polishing the bottoms at the very end. And then these pads here that they make, um, they're a little different shape. They're a little stiffer. These are very flexible. See how much they flex? They really bend. These, not so much. So they have different purposes. These are great because you can bend them like this and get them inside little areas like handles and stuff. So that's why I like these here. These don't work so well for getting in the handles. Is, some, is there a purpose for using vinegar with water when wiping off pieces? I have never done that, Catherine. Yeah, I have never, I've never used vinegar in my water. I mean, maybe they feel the vinegar is cutting through any grease or fingerprints that's on, like any greasy stuff or residue that's on the surface as a cleaning solution. You're using the vinegar. That's my only thinking behind that. Uh, I've just always used plain water because it's been in the kiln. It does have clay dust on it. When you pick it up, you, you're putting fingerprints and grease and just stuff on it. So you, you do want to you do want to wipe it down some way. So these come in, I believe, three grits. I only have two. I have a 60 and a 120. The 120 is the one I use the most. I have two of these actually. And I've had two of them for about five years, five years. And I'm still using them. They are not worn out at all. So they last. This 60 grit I've had also for about five years. And you can see it looks pretty worn because it gets used a lot, but it's it's fine. It's going to keep going. It might outlast me. I don't know at this rate. Diamond core. Yes, I just saw that. Diamond core tools now has diamond sandpaper. I saw that. Yes. So that's a new product they have. They have the sandpaper so that the paper can actually get in there and reach. I don't, I don't have anything with a handle on it here, but it can get in there and reach. So how do you use these? Whatever you're using to sand, you want a wet sand. You always want to wet sand when you can. So, you know, make sure the piece is wet. Let's grab our 120, dip that in as well, and then we sand. So this is a piece that when I signed it, I carved it when it was leather hard with, um, I don't know if I used a needle tool or what I used, but it was really rough, so it needed to be smooth. But now it's nice. So that's good and then you feel the sides and you feel the lip and we're good there's nothing I have to sand check inside too so the last two bisque fires you did had some yellow smear on them uh, you thought you cleaned them before but it really affected the cream you were using and it turned it a mottled yellow so what did you do to the pieces you know what what clay were you using um, did you wax them? Maybe you accidentally smeared a darker clay or some sort of material that you had on your fingers and didn't realize was there on it. Sometimes there's salts in the clay that comes out during the bisque firing and that can cause the yellow in it. So there's a, there's a few variables. So it's always a puzzle, right? We have to figure it out and find out why something is, is acting up. So this is done, ready to go. Now, you want to feel your carved spots because sometimes they can have rough edges. This was done with a time and core tool and it's fine. I don't have to do anything to it. So let's feel this one. So Lisa's sharing a really great hack. Yeah, so that, um, this, this clay studio I used to work at, I was a resident at, they did the same thing. They used a piece of carpet in water and you rub the bottom. Yep, that's, that's used a lot in production pottery. It's a really great tip. Thanks, Lisa, for bringing that up and sharing with everybody. Yeah, you take a, a carpet scrap or remnant and you find a tray 
is the best way to do it, that it, and you cut it to fit that tray, and then you pour a little water on top of it, and then when your pieces are glazed, you take them like this and you just rub them on it. You can go back and forth. I always rub in circles. Wax on, wax off sort of thing going on. So we're going to wipe this one down. And this was a bowl similar to the ones we were making yesterday, except I didn't alter it, and it's a little smaller. Now let's try these over here. I need to sand a little bit off the bottom. I'm going to go with the 200 grit. Sometimes when I carve my signature into the underglaze on the bottom, it will leave a few rough spots. So I just want to take care of that right now. And I'm not sanding so deeply that it sands away the underglaze. It's just getting rid of any burrs or anything. Sanding clay does, and that's why we are using water. Yep, that's why we're wet sanding. Right, exactly. So you notice I wet it with the sponge. I dip. I might have forgotten to do that because I was talking to you all. But you see I'm actually using water when I'm sanding, and that's what you want to do because you don't want that silica dust. So if you wet sand, you do not need to use a respirator. If you do not wet sand, you need to use a respirator, and you should probably do it outside because you want that silica dust that you're stirring up to go out into the environment and not be in your studio where you're breathing it. And I have a, a little rough spot right here where I just a little nick in the clay. So I'm going to go ahead and see how we can bend these. And it gets right in and it sands that out. So it takes care of that little imperfection and it's gone. Yes, yeah, safety is one of the most important things in a ceramic studio. When I was a student, my professor, one of my professors, was like, oh, don't worry about it. You're just a student. You're not going to be making pottery for the rest of your life. And so we were all like, okay. So we didn't wear masks, and we sanded everything, and sometimes dry swept, and didn't even really think about it. But I'm very careful now. So, so many people are saying how much they love last night's Raku firing. That was really fun. So once you have your pieces, so we did a cup, we did a, did a bowl. Let's do a plate. I want to show you three different things. So here's a plate that just came out of the bisque kiln this morning. So let's feel it. Plates sometimes end up with rough spots on the rims and sometimes on the foot ring. So let's wipe this down using a white clay with grog. So I'm not familiar with that uh, I am CO clay in Sacramento. What I would do is, Terry, I would reach out to the manufacturer because they're gonna have um, dealt with issues that they've had with their clay. So that's the best way to find out. I don't use that clay, so I'm not familiar with it having issues. But I know B-Mix, sometimes salts come out and you see that. So we're wet sanding. I felt a little burr on the foot ring. We're getting a bunch of snow today. Again. <laughs> we're having a snowstorm right now outside. The plow just went by. We're having uh, probably one of the snowiest winters we've had in many years. Vinegar and water can help eliminate hard spots in greenware that you may have had with pouring molds. Oh, interesting. So that feels good. Let's double check this room. So it takes time to do this, but wouldn't you rather spend a few minutes, there's a spot, checking your pieces, prepping them, and getting them ready, than not doing it. You spend the time glazing and you get it out and you find out that there's this, this burr that's a problem because the only thing you can do about it then is you can sand it down, grind it down, reglaze it and then fire it again but that can alter the way the glaze looks and one thing you can do to really prevent lots of cleaning up is to make sure before you put things in your bisque while they're dry check them then and wipe anything down as you're loading it in the bisque kiln or if you want to get them ready and do it the day before but and so that plate's ready so that's the next that's the next step 
you want to get a banding wheel, what height do I, you, do you, you want to know what height I suggest? Well, what are you going to do with your banding wheel? This one here is just the, I believe this is the 8 inch Shimpo. I'm going to measure it and tell you. It's made by Nidec now though, they've changed their Nidec bot Shimpo. So this is their, it's actually 8 and 3 quarters, almost 9, so they might call it a 9 inch. And it is a little over two inches high. This is my oldest and most favorite banding wheel. Now, I use it for all my hand building because I stand when I hand build. So this works really good for me. Although I could sit um, and do it. They do make a taller one, which is nice because it brings it up. So if you're going to do a lot of decoration, you might want the taller one. But this is my go-to. When people ask me, like, I'm going to get a banding wheel, that's the one I go with. All right, so you have, you love snow, but you're happy that it's 64 there today. Yeah, we won't get 64 until May, if we're lucky. <laughs> so we got a few more months. So now we want to go ahead and wax the bottoms. Now, if you're going to be painting on glaze and brushing on glaze, you might not need to wax your bottoms. You probably won't need to wax the bottoms. If you're going to be dipping and pouring your glaze, you'll want to. Now you can use the hack that, Les that Lisa shared this morning and wipe it off, which works unless you have um, a lot of carving on the bottom like I tend to do, and that can be an issue. And for me, some clays, some glazes that are really rich in iron will stain the bottom even after you've wiped away. So if I want that bottom to be pristine, if I'm doing a porcelain piece or something and I have a very high iron content piece, I want to make sure that iron doesn't stain it because sometimes you can get that. And I don't know if any of you have found that to happen with your own pieces. So I wax my bottoms um, for dipping and pouring. If I know I'm brushing, I won't wax the bottom if I know for sure. So what kind of wax should you use? I like water-based wax, not a latex, but a wax. And any will do. Amico has a good wax. This is Mr. Mark's Wax On. That's a good one here. I've used Forbes Wax. That's a really good wax as well. Uh, I think Laguna has a good wax. Now, for waxing the bottoms, any of the brand waxes will work for you. This happens to be the same wax I use for doing my Jeshima, so when I'm carving. So I'm just doing a two for one. I use the same wax for everything because I have to have it for the carving, so I might as well use it for the bottoms of my pieces. So we're just going to pour this. This container has the teeniest, tiniest little top, as you can see. So I can't get any brushes. Well, I could get a skinny brush down in there, but I, I, that would make such a mess. So I pour it out into a little dish here, and then when I'm done, I, I pour what's left back into the bottle. So I'm going to get my craft foam brush wet. These craft foam brushes, if you rinse them out after you use them, they'll last for many, many waxing sessions. So you don't have to throw them away. And I know they're a disposable product, but they last as long um, as a regular brush would for me. So I go with them. So let's start again with the cup we were doing. You just got the Mr. Mark's wax and you love it. I I love it too. I get mine from Sheffield Pottery. Uh, the ceramic, I think it's the ceramic shop sells it. So I'm just dipping in my wax and then I'm wiping my bottom. It's all about the bottoms. And then after I've done that, I don't usually go up the side. I, I will wipe the side with a sponge and that's it. If if I knew I was going to be using a really drippy glaze and I was afraid that I would, you know, have to really scrub it off, I would wax the foot ring up a bit and I'll just show you. I'll wax it up. So I use the little foam brush and I just go around. Before I used foam brushes, I just used a piece of sponge. I would just cut up a little sponge and then you just roll it up and you use the sponge to apply. And this has a nice edge. The brush does, the foam brush. So that's the whole foot. The whole foot and nothing but the foot. Now, if you want to glaze your foot, don't wax the bottom, right? And then after it's waxed, you've got to sit it to the side. So on this bowl, um, actually for this bowl, I am going to wax the bottom. 
my signature's on there, so we're just going to go ahead and wax it. Do I dilute the wax with water? Nope, I don't. Not this wax. You don't need to use it. This is a water-based wax, so if you were going to, um, you know, you could dilute it if you wanted to. It's actually rather thin as it is right now, so I am not going to dilute it. Companies like Forbes that sells their wax, you will want to dilute. Sometimes they sell them really concentrated. Uh, if it's an oil-based wax, you do not want to add water to it. It'll separate. So just make sure whatever wax you're using, if you're adding water to it, make sure that it can have water or you'll ruin your wax. Most companies are not shipping wax in the winter, or at least in colder areas, because if it freezes, it separates too. Now, I'm going to set this upside down, so make sure wherever you put this is clean, because we did just spend all that time cleaning the piece and preparing it. We have a plate. Wax on, wax off. Yes. <laughs> and so I see some folks adding, yeah, add alumina hydrate to your wax. You know, that will help if you're waxing your lids so you don't get sticking lids. It also helps in the bottom of pieces if you get plucking. Plucking usually happens with porcelain. What happens is the porcelain clay starts to vitrify and actually melt onto your kiln shelf. And so when you go to take that porcelain piece up, the clay itself tries to stick to the shelf and some of it stays behind. If you put a little alumina hydrate in your wax, it will eliminate plucking. If you have that problem, I am not using a porcelain. I'm using B-Mix, and I don't have an issue with plucking on this. The, the other thing that I haven't tried with the alumina hydrate in the wax is on large pieces. I wonder if that helps it move during firing. You know, one of the issues we have with really large pieces, like, for example, this platter here, right? One of the issues we have is that as it's firing in the kiln, as it heats up, the piece expands, and then as it cools, it contracts, right? So what will happen is it will, it'll expand during the heating up, but then as it's cooling down, it can't contract correctly because it can't move because it's so big and heavy. It doesn't have anything to move on. It needs something, something under it so that it can move and it will crack. So if you ever do large pieces and they crack, you need to put something under them when you're firing them. So I don't know if alumina hydrate in the wax would help facilitate that because I do put alumina hydrate under my pieces when I'm firing them. And you could use your kiln wash and dry form as a powder under your big pieces so that they can move. You could also use a silica sand or a grog like a fine or medium mesh grog would work really well for that. I did not wax the inside of this piece because I'm gonna go ahead and I will glaze the bottom when we do this. So when you use wax, you feel like you're gonna get it all over the place. <laughs> Where do I have to be careful of contamination? So when you're using wax, wax the wax itself is, is like not gonna cause any harm to you. The, what you want to do is not get wax on other things. So if you get wax on your hands and you pick up the rim of a plate, you've just put wax on the rim of that plate. So now that wax will resist the glaze and you'll have a bare spot. So if you get wax where you don't want it, you have a couple options. You can try sanding it down and see if that helps. Sometimes that will. You can, some people use a blowtorch or a heat gun and try to melt it off. I have not found that to work for me. What I do, and I'm sorry, it's the most disappointing answer I can give you, is I bisque fire it again and it burns that wax off and then I start all over. I have a mug right now that when I was glazing it, um, when I was waxing it, I accidentally drip wax down the side. I tried sanding and I can still see some wax there. So I'm going to have to go ahead and bisque fire that in my next bisque fire so it can't be glazed this time. Which is very disappointing because I had it out and I was starting to glaze it. You know, I had a plan for it, but it has to wait. But that's my best solution for that. So would the alumina or silica sand be added to the shelf during the bisque or the glaze? I do it for both. 
both. Uh, this large piece just came out of my kiln this morning. It has no cracks, it's in perfect condition, and I fired it on a layer of alumina hydrate in my kiln. On the bottom shelf, mind you, and I know a lot of people don't fire on the bottom shelf because it cools very fast there, which can be a problem, but my kiln cools really evenly, so I don't have to worry about that. So I'm gonna get the side. Now I'll be painting the glaze on this, so really, I, I'm being over cautious. I'm just showing you how to, how to do it. So once you're done and your pieces are all waxed and you're ready to go, um, you need to wait for them to dry. I wipe my foam brush off as best I can. And then I rinse it out in some warm soapy water. And then I just put it back in the little bucket where it lives and then I use it uh, for the next time. So it's pretty simple. I do put it back in the container. I tend to, I save as much as I can um, that's in that dish. I'll scrape that back in. So your local pottery supply has it for two to three dollars for a small bag. Very handy. Good. Good, good, good. Yeah. Let's see. You get wax on a piece, put it in your oven and bake 30 minutes at 450. It'll burn off. You could do that. Sure. Um, I, for me, I just tossed it back in a bisque kiln. But that's a great solution. Yeah. So uh, Sally has a good uh, fix for that, a little hack. If you get wax, you can put it in your oven to 450 and the wax will burn off. Just be careful when you do that because you're heating it up and cooling it down. Um, when you get above 400 degrees, whenever you go above 400 degrees, that's when you start getting into the danger zone for, um, you know, heat thermal shock for your pieces. So just it, put it in, put the piece in first, then turn the oven on. Do not turn the oven on first, then put the piece in. You never want to do that. Even with handmade finished pottery for baking, you want to put the piece in and then turn it on. You don't preheat. So you put your piece in, turn it up to 450, let it go all the way up, turn it off, and let it cool down. So you can't just stick it in. Be, I mean, you might do it a couple times and be lucky, but at some point you are going to get cracking. And you also are risking the integrity of the piece at the end result. So alcohol it. I have tried alcohol. It didn't work on, on my pieces. It just doesn't come off. It's really in, it's in the pores. It's down in there. So I've only found burning it away. So, um, let's see. Alumina hydrate will not blow around in the kiln. I have not had a problem with alumina hydrate blowing in my kiln. You know, yes, there is air currents in our kilns and we are running a vent. And so there is, you know, air movement in that kiln but I've never had it blow into other pieces and cause problems for me. So, so when, why do I not just put a lid on the container and use the wax the next time? This right here, even with a, even with a lid on this, it'll form this air space in here and it will still dry a little bit on the top. I'll get a skin on it for this wax. I mean, I could fill it up higher and that would help prevent that. But I just scrape it back in and reuse the same container for a while and that works well carefully reuse by putting it back in the jar exactly so that's how to prep your work now that's prepped we're going to glaze it and we're going to do some melty mako combos we'll be doing that next so come back here and join me at 10:45 for that tutorial and if you're going to be working along with me get yourself some bisque pieces and i'm using a bunch of mako glazes I'm going to do a combo with Night Moth and Blue Opal. I'm going to do a yellow combo with, with Blue Hydrangea, Frosted Lemon, and Light Flux. And we'll see if I have time to do another one. So we'll see how many we can get done. So I'll, I'll see you all in about 15.